you too. And, uh, and thanks for convincing us to make Pandora a free service, which was obviously one of the most significant and, and good decisions we made over many years. Um, so I know we have a lot of entrepreneurs in the audience here tonight, and, and it sounds like many of them at a very early stage. So uh, I thought I would, I would talk a little bit about the five years that Jim didn't talk about, which I, I hope don't mirror the experience you may be about to have. Uh, but in which I think there are some learnings for you. And, and I would really love to have a conversation. So um, maybe what I'll do is I'll kind of walk through those first five years and, and how we wound up uh, eventually becoming the company we are now. And, and um, uh, if there are things about that that are interesting to you, um, I'm, I'm really happy to have a conversation. Uh, so don't be shy about asking me questions. Um, so I, I found the company uh, 11 years ago. I was, as Jim said, I was a musician before this. And I actually, uh, I think that, I was in a rock, rock band for a long time, and I actually think being in a rock band is great preparation for being an entrepreneur. And eventually even a CEO, which I was actually, I don't know officially or not, but at various times uh, in Pandora, because there are, there are many things about being in a rock band that are the same as being an entrepreneur. Uh, you have no money, um, <laughs> a very, very uncertain future. It's a creative process. Uh, and you're pulling together kind of a group of people and getting them to, to sort of collectively build, build sort of one thing, unify around a vision, and, and uh, you're kind of doing that in a relatively sort of stressful environment. Uh, and you also have to sell, uh, because ultimately, you know, bands don't have uh, very many, um, can someone turn the projector off? By what, is that possible? It's just shiny right now. Um, you don't have a lot of sort of easy promotional tools at your disposal, so you really need to learn how to sell. Uh, you have to book band, you have to book gigs, you have to get on the radio. Uh, you have to sort of convince a lot of people to believe in your vision. And and in fact, when I sort of wound up in this multi-year odyssey, uh, it didn't feel all that different. Thank you. It didn't feel all that different for me from what I had been doing before uh, Pandora. Uh, I had I had eaten ramen a lot before I started this company, um, and, and I, I lived on credit cards at various times. And, and so I, I felt that it was actually quite good preparation. Uh, the initial idea for Pandora grew out of my experiences as a musician, uh, initially playing in rock bands and then being a film composer for a while. And uh, when you're a film composer, your job is to understand uh, what a director wants for their movie. And you sit down with them, and you have sort of a musical interview, and you, you play songs, and you get their feedback, that kind of thumbs up, thumbs down, and you, and, you, and you translate that feedback into musicological information, which you, you then use when you go back to the recording studio to, um, to write a piece of music. And so I had begun sort of informally uh, understanding what people like in, in sort of a genomic sense. I, I, I could have a, a conversation with a director, and then I could translate that into musical information. And I got pretty good at, at, at sort of uh, predicting what someone wanted and, and writing music for them. And the idea popped into my head, it was kind of 1999, if you remember that really insane, insane period of time here, when everybody was launching companies and, and venture capital money was flowing like a river. Uh, I had this idea to codify that sort of genomic approach to, to understanding musical taste and, and then leveraging technology in the web to, to build a recommendation engine. And the, the initial thesis of the company was that we would build this intellectual property and license it out to this growing array of music properties, portals and, uh, and websites, et cetera, uh, CD Now, um, uh, eMusic, IUMA, this sort of, this, this, this uh, generation uh, of new music businesses. And, and through an API, we kind of become a, a licensed source of technology. And we, 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 launched, we raised about a million and a half bucks in March of 2000, literally two weeks before the shit hit the fan. Um, and having no idea what we were, gonna, uh, what we were uh, signing up for, uh, we built sort of a prototype. Uh, and it took us about uh, a year to build the, the very first version of the recommendation engine, which was essentially a website with a little search box on it. You typed in a song, and it would pull up uh, a dozen songs that, that had sort of shared similar musical characteristics uh, with that song. And uh, the, since the very first, so we had spent, I think, about nine months, it took us to build this prototype. Very time consuming, and, and uh, we burned through a pretty good percentage of that money we'd raised. And uh, the first song we typed into this uh, search engine was a Beatles track. 
we had a few thousand songs that we had analyzed and, and added to our database. And it pops up this list of songs. And the first song, the closest song according to the Music Genome Project was the Bee Gees. It's like, oh shit. <laughs> We're a million bucks into this and uh, it doesn't work. <laughs> Where's the exit door? Um, well, actually, um, it turns out we, went, we, we saw that, uh, we, we, we saw the song title, but then we played the song. And uh, for anybody here as a Bee Gees fan, you'll know that before they became Saturday Night Fever in the disco era, they were essentially a copycat Beatles band. And so I played the song, and I thought we had had the wrong audio, as it sounded literally like the Beatles. I thought it was the Beatles. They actually were signed by the same manager that signed the Beatles. And so we went from, oh shit, to, whoa, like this really works. It's, it's making a musicological connection. It knows nothing about the sort of metadata around these artists, but it's actually connecting, connecting songs very accurately. So really exciting moment for us, and, and uh, we thought, man, we've got wrong something pretty special here. Uh, unfortunately, we were beginning to run out of money uh, uh, at that time. And as you know, 2001, not a great year to be raising money. Uh, and, and we had begun to try, uh, and we're getting the sense that it was going to be tough. And so, in order to kind of stretch the finances that we had uh, left, um, we began uh, asking our employees to, to work for a smaller and smaller fraction of their salary. Until by the end of 01, we had, we were, everybody was working for nothing. <laughs> we call that salary deferral. <laughs> Turns out it's illegal in California to do that. <laughs> And you can actually go to jail, or, or at least back then it wasn't clear if we, if we would or not. Uh, fortunately, we couldn't afford an attorney, so we didn't know that we were breaking the law. Uh, good thing, because uh, that would have added an unnecessary additional layer of stress to the experience. Um, but what happened was, uh, late, late 2001, uh, this group of people, and there were about 50 of them, uh, sort of signed up to work for nothing, and for about two and a half years, we didn't pay salary. Uh, every now and then we kind of coax a little bridge money out of someone and, and uh, we signed some licensing deals that brought some cash into the company, but for all intents and purposes, uh, for about two and a half years, we didn't pay people. And uh, uh, it was a pretty uh, insane uh, period of time. We wound up surviving it. It turns out uh, when you don't pay people, it doesn't cost a lot to run a company. So you can you can kind of carry on. And we, we made it through the end of 2003. Uh, and uh, um, in very early 2004, uh, March 2004, about four years after uh, we first began, uh, we managed to successfully raise our first large institutional round, which was led um, by a fellow named Larry Marcus, who's a, a partner at Walden, D.C. And interestingly, the, the second largest investment in that round came from a, a called Labrador Ventures in Palo Alto. And uh, the, the way I connected to Labrador is I was at one of these over in, uh, in, in Berkeley. It was, a, I think it was called Golden Gate Capital Network or something. And I was in one of these speed pitches. We start off with 100 people, and then it was five minutes long, and then you went to three minutes, and then a minute, and like 10 seconds or something crazy, you know, pitching your company. And, and uh, I, I wound up doing well in that competition. In the room was somebody who kind of got intrigued by the idea. It was, it, it was an, uh, a fundraising agent and came up to me afterwards and said, hey, I like your story. Can I, how about I'll go try and raise some money for you? And he wound up connecting me to, the, to Larry uh, Kubal, uh, a partner at, at Labrador, who then became kind of the, the second anchor tenant for that Series B financing. And the, the moral for me of that is you, know, you never know where uh, financing is going to come from. Uh, by the time I, I raised money from Walden, I had pitched Pandora, I, I went back and counted, uh, out of some morbid sense of humor, uh, 348 times <laughs> over those couple year period. Uh, and, and, you know, I pitched all sorts of people, uh, from uh, close relatives to, you know, hedge funds uh, and everything in between. I actually think that I probably spent more time raising money than I should have because it was largely fruitless, obviously, and I might have better spent my time trying to build a business, but it's hard to do that when, you're, when you have no cash. And, and at the end of 2003, uh, I had 12 maxed out credit cards. I had, you know, 
I owed a colossal amount of money to anybody who was un unfortunate enough to meet me during that time. Uh, and uh, and uh, it was a, a pretty uh, frightening one. We, we owed about a million and a half bucks of, of, uh, of uh, salary, back salary, uh, to uh, a collection of employees. And one of the really generous uh, gestures that the, the Series B financing uh, team did uh, really at the behest of Larry was to pay all that back. Uh, and I think all the investors here tonight would say, huh, you did what? Um, most money is really used to, to go forward, but I think it was just a huge vote of confidence and, and a, gr a very grand gesture uh, in, in, in the business. And uh, I still remember the all hands meeting we had. Uh, we had all hands meetings every two weeks. And typically the, the subject of the all hands was, can you work for two more weeks for nothing? <laughs> so they weren't like pep rallies. Um, and this particular all hands meeting, I sat down and no one knew that we had raised the money because I decided to really insulate the employees from that experience. And I just pulled up this huge wad of envelopes in my back pocket. And every time I say this, my, my arm feels this bumpy. Uh, slap it down on the table and like, hand it out checks for you know, the group of people who have been working for I, two and a half years. And some people got like a $100,000 or $2,000 check um, that I thought, I think they had completely written off at that point. Um, wonderfully rewarding moment. Um, and, and then in, in 2004, we raised this large uh, uh, venture round and really did then reconceptualize the company. Uh, and, and one of the things that I would sort of communicate to the entrepreneurs in the room is that I think a lot of investors will have a sort of a mantra that they, that they say, we invest in people. Uh, and I think that's a wise uh, thing to do. And, and I think the reason they do that is because the business plan that it, an entrepreneur comes to them with is very unlikely to be the one that they end up with. And sometimes it can be radically different. And, and ultimately the success of the investment I think is much more about the ability of the team to change course and to embrace you know, change. And, and here we were, we were, as Jim said, we were a kiosk company. Um, we were installing uh, IBM and NCR kiosks in Best Buys and Borders and Tower Records around the country. Um, and it was, a, it was a struggling business, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, and uh, we took this big round and then really sat down and said, okay, we've spent five years building this massive piece of intellectual property. What else could we do with it? And, and I had the great fortune uh, a couple months later uh, hiring a fellow named Joe Kennedy, who is now our CEO and has been for seven years. And Joe really kind of led that process inside, inside the company. And you know, another lesson that I take away from that is you know, know when to bring people in around you and know to understand your role and adapt uh, your role over time. Joe is a has been a terrific CEO, uh, you know, came into kind of a somewhat dysfunctional situation, but kind of a, a very interesting uh, uh, asset, uh, the sort of a green field uh, of what to do uh, next with it. And, and uh, we've, I think, assembled a terrific team. It took us about a year um, to, to go from there to, to uh, launching this radio uh, product, uh, which as Jim said, we launched in the fall of uh, 2005, initially as a subscription business, um, and uh, ha have grown the company significantly. Uh, but nothing is more rewarding for me uh, as an entrepreneur, as much as this company has changed, to see all these new people around the table now, where uh, the executive staff has completely turned over uh, since the very early part of the company, uh, and our product has changed dramatically, and it's a whole new team on board, but there's still really a same sense of, of mission and purpose that we started with. We just finding it, are finding a different way of expressing it. Uh, and we launched, and, and, and it's really been kind of a dream in the last, uh, last five years. And I'll, I'll share one more anecdote, and then I, I'd love to <coughs> take questions from you guys and gals. Um, so a few years ago, 